we were very pleased in San Francisco to meet up with a number of legendary cartoonists, including Patrick Chapat, uh, who works for many publications, including the international edition of the New York Times. Patrick was so popular at the, uh, the American convention that he'd run out of business cards. So what did he do? He drew me one. I mean, how charming is that? He drew me his own business card, so I now have it hanging on my studio wall. Uh, if you've read your booklet, you will know that Chapat was born in Pakistan and raised in Singapore, uh, and Switzerland by a Lebanese mother and a Swiss father. Patrick is known for his striking uh, and forceful cartoons that display an elegance of style, all of which deal with international concerns and issues. Beautiful, huh? Just, just. Chapat has traveled the world from one hot spot to another, promoting and discussing different aspects of cartooning. Therefore, we in the trade have a lot of time for what Patrick has to say. Now, Chapat was acquainted with Shab, Kabu, Walensky, and in per particular, Tignus, the four cartoonists who were initially slaughtered in the Charlie Hebdo offices in Paris this past January. And this is the very uh, touching cartoon uh, that he drew at the time on the subject. We're now going to talk uh, with uh, Patrick from his home base in Los Angeles, I hope. Patrick. <laughs> All right, Patrick. <laughs> Great. So nice of you to do this, Patrick. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. OK. You can see I cut my hair. Uh, Patrick, the Chinese might say that cartoonists are now living in interesting times. Do you recall your initial reaction to the shootings in Paris? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, it was night in Los Angeles when the terrible thing happened in Paris. And uh, so I was sleeping, and I heard uh, of that voice in my dream. And the voice was uh, saying, Charlie Hebdo has been attacked. And the voice went on, and they shot at the newsroom. Um, Charb, Volinsky, Cabu, Tinius were killed. And it was the, the voice of my wife whispering in my ears. So, and she said, you must have a lot of message, so stand up. And so literally, I woke up to that nightmare and uh, I guess the nightmare has been going on. Uh, the realization of that day when a line had been crossed in blood and, in a way, innocence was lost. Patrick, why do you think those things are so upsetting? I mean, that's not really our initial goal. Maybe to amuse or cut or whatever, but not to, up, not to upset to that extent. Well, you know, as well as me, cartoons are a powerful tool of communication. You take a cartoon in the face even before you understand it. Uh, they images, they short circuit thinking and reasoning, you know, they, they don't need translations. So that's a very powerful tool. And, uh, but very often cartoons are often to interpretation. They can be ambiguous. Humor needs a perimeter to work. Uh, to make a joke, you need an audience, right? And so now we are being told that whatever we draw or say, in whatever corner of Europe or, or Canada, could be seen in the, in, in the streets of Lagos or Peshawar or Jakarta. That's the, that's the starting point of huge misunderstandings. You know what? Maybe we are experiencing the first conflict of globalization, and it's a cultural one. But let's just remember one thing. Uh, we don't wake up as cartoonists in the morning thinking, OK, who am I going to offend today? That's not. The definition of the job, that's, I mean, uh, to, to be hurtful, to provoke for the sake of provocation, that's not what cartooning is about. It's always about making a point, expressing an opinion, and it can hurt in the process. Opinions can hurt, and people might find them, you know, dangerous, and people have tried to kill opinions. What do you think we've learned in uh, uh, the aftermath of both the, the Mohammed cartoons in Denmark uh, and, of course, the Charlie Hebdo? Have we learned from these things? 
Well, I think that we learned that we live in an open world with closed minds. Yeah. Um, since, ever since the Danish cartoons controversy in 2005, we have been living with that shadow over our head, the threat that cartoonists might be uh, shot at at some point. You know, the, the figure of Muhammad has become such a symbolic sticking point. It's, uh, it's been a tool of, uh, of uh, provocation for firebrands on the extreme right and people who hide behind uh, the flag of freedom of speech for uh, their own uh, you know, anti-Muslim agenda. And of course, uh, on the other side, for a lot of Muslims, the figure of Muhammad has become like uh, also a sticking point of, of something totally different, uh, where a lot of other things enter, like political frustrations, uh, you know, social demands, the notions of pride, and, uh, and, and the, a, a lot of things. So it's be, cartoons have become symbolic of something else something much bigger than they are actually. And you know, symbols are dangerous because people go to war, symbols. Uh, how, do you, how do you feel about Western media? Most of Western media was, of course, very sympathetic uh, to, to the cause, but at the same time were very, very reticent about printing the cartoons themselves from Charlie Hebdo and, and initially, too, with the, with the Muhammad cartoons. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, I'm glad that a lot of, of newspapers, most of them, uh, show their support for cartoonists. I wish they had, uh, you know, uh, translated that support in hiring more cartoonists. It would have been nice. Um, but, you know, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with uh, a newspaper defending freedom of expression without publishing the cartoons. Because um, to defend uh, an opinion, to defend freedom of, op of opinion, you don't have to endorse that opinion. And the same goes for cartoons. I don't know how many people have been coming to cartoonists and telling them after that, so now, would you, draw to, would you dare to draw Muhammad? Why? What's the point? For me, Muhammad has never been an issue. It's, it's never been a, a topic of cartoon. Uh, jihadism, political extremism, the integration of Muslims, uh, or the anti-Muslim obsessions of some, those are, uh, those are fair game. Those are the subject of cartoons. I, let's switch gears here, because I, I'm very curious about this, uh, and it's quite a fascinating aspect of, of your, your career, really. Tell us about your reasons for carrying out these uh, interesting uh, international workshops with working cartoonists all around the world. Yeah, well, I've had this obsession like for the last 10 years, and I guess since the Danish cartoons controversy, about this idea that you know cartoons, cartoonists could be utilized and enrolled in a propaganda war. And we don't want to be nobody's soldiers. We don't want to fight any war except the war against stupidity and brutality in the world. So obsessed by, by, by this thing, I've been doing workshop uh, for the last 10 years in, in countries of conflict. And uh, to try to see how cartoonists manage over there in other countries. Because now we can say the danger is global, but hey, this has been going on for a long time. For a lot of cartoonists, drawing was a mortal danger. So I've been organizing workshop in, in, uh, in conflicts of countries, and the idea is pretty simple, to bring cartoonists together and to let them work together. So cartoonists from different sides, different camps, like you can uh, look at uh, Ivory Coast, where at some point the press was described as a press of hatred, um, and, and let them work together on a hot issue affecting their country. Because actually, I do believe that humor is a good way to tackle serious issues. So, been doing that in Serbia about the perception of the of the of the role of Serbians in the war, in in the war, in the Balkan wars, in 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 Kenya about ethnicity, in Lebanon about conflictionalism. I think it's also interesting to see that cartooning is a is a positive force, is a, a and we need to find ways to have to criticize with with a sense of dialogue. You also do some very interesting work. Uh, Wes was very curious about this, my colleague. Uh, your reportage uh, in the form of graphic novels. Yeah, I don't know how to call it, neither. Um, you know, comics journalism, graphic journalism, has many words. Uh, you know, editorial cartooning is black and white, but uh, reality is gray. 
And uh, sometimes I feel frustrated as a cartoonist. I want to go take a chance to go and see the places and the faces that are in the news. So I go like a journalist. I take notes. I make pictures. Uh, I don't draw that much. It's not always easy, depending on the context. I've been to places like uh, Gaza during the war or in the slums of Nairobi, stuff like that. Uh, and, and in Guatemala, uh, to do a story about gang violence. And the idea is just to come back and report as a cartoonist, so in the form of graphic novels. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, it can be applied. There are a lot of guys doing that out there, even, uh, I mean, everywhere. And, and every aspect of the news can be covered. It can be social issues. It can be local issues in Toronto. It can be, I did a story about K-pop in South Korea after Gangnam Style, so I think it's... Your good, it's friend, your good friend Cal is here, and a little while he's going to be talking to us about, uh, in a very optimistic way, about the future of cartooning. He's, he's quite the optimist. How do you feel about the future uh, of cartooning? Optimistic? Pessimistic? Well, I know that, uh, of course, the internet has been a, a major di disruption in the news, so it has affected some cartoonists on the economic side. But at the same time, it's a whole world of possibilities. And uh, first, for young cartoonists, it's a chance to find an audience uh, without going through a publisher. So that's, that's great. And then for, um, for us, for all of us, it's, it's an open field to explore and ex experiment. Uh, you just mentioned Cal. He's, he's doing amazing things in 3D. Anne, who's going to speak, I think, after me, uh, is doing animation, so there are a lot of things we can explore and experiment on the internet. Plus, social media is a good news because uh, traditional publishers who are going on social media and want to build an, a strong audience there, they are starting to realize that cartoons are something that people love to share. So, yeah, I think it's uh, the playing field is wide open in front of us. It's going to be fun. Patrick, merci mille fois. À la prochaine. Okay. À la prochaine. Merci, Patrick.